All right, looks like we've hit critical mass here. So let's go ahead and get started. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Barrett Louie and I'm part of the marketing team here at Risk IQ, And we are thrilled that you were able to join us for today's workshop. Uh, today we'll be exploring methodologies for threat analysis, a walk through use cases and work through hands-on exercises. Before we get started, there are a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, first, today's workshop is being recorded. Second, today's session will be interactive. Throughout the workshop, we'll be unmuting lines for questions and conversation. If you have a question while your line is muted, please send them through the questions window in the GoToWebinar control panel. The team will answer as many questions as we can as we go. Now, let me introduce you to the team that's here to support you today. First, Benjamin Powell. He's Risk IQ's technical marketing manager and will be leading today's workshop with Orr Schwartz, our West Coast Solutions architect. Next, there are a couple folks here to help answer questions that you may have and help you troubleshoot any uh, login or promo code application issues. So uh, first is Mike Stadler. He's our East Coast account executive. And then there's also Jacqueline Witter, who is our senior events manager. Now that you've met the team, I'll hand it over to Benjamin. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. And I, I love to see so many people are uh, joining us today to uh, learn more about threat hunting. Um, today we're gonna be doing some very cool things. So we're gonna do an advanced investigation that Orr is gonna walk us through. And then we're gonna do an inter intermediate um, advanced type of exercise as well to do some proactive threat hunting. Um, one thing I want to let everybody know is uh, once you register for um, the community version of Passive Total, um, you can enter this promo code. And I'm going to go through in a couple minutes and show you how to enter the promo code. The promo code uh, is a one day promo code to give you uh, unlimited queries for today. Certain features, for, ex for example, exposed services, are only available in our paid version, the enterprise version. Uh, because we don't want everybody in the world to be able to go find vulnerabilities and things like that. We want to make sure that we vetted the security professionals and make sure that they're really a security professional before we give them access to the entire world to find um, exposed services out there. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to go through and talk about some of the tools that we're going to be um, um, doing today, uh, we're using today. Um, Passive Total. Um, Google Safe Browsing, URL Scan IO, Hybrid Analysis, Virus Total, um, JavaScript, Beautifier, and Base64 Decoding. So what's unique about what we're doing is we're really trying to teach you how to threat hunt. And it's not only in our own product, we're using other open source and free tools out there to show you what the day in the life of a threat investigator or incident responder, SOC person, analyst, um, news reporter trying to investigate, um, cyber attacks and things like that, trying to show you what you might need to do to get your job done. And so we're gonna go through and show you um, how you can use, leverage all these tools to get the little pieces that you might need to further your investigation along. So the promo code that we're using today is a one day promo code. After today, we're gonna send you an email with uh, an evaluation that we're gonna ask you to fill out so we can see how we're doing, uh, get ideas for types of use cases you want to see for next time. Um, and we're going to give you a longer promo code at the end. So you'll be emailed a one week promo code after that, and then you'll be contacted by Risk IQ to get you into a real enterprise trial where you can see the exposed services and you can really kick the tires for the full features of everything that Risk IQ um, is doing. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to make sure that you've gone out to community.riskiq.com slash registration. If you haven't registered before, register for the um, uh, your account. And what I'd like you to do is if you can, please use your corporate email account. In the future, we're gonna make some changes that you're gonna get some additional functionality if you're using a, a corporate email account and not like a Gmail account or Yahoo account. Um, so please make sure that you're doing that. And the promo code today, it's case sensitive. It is VRTHW underscore 0625. And then once you register, 
we're going to send you an email and you need to click on the email and verify that you that's your real account and once you do that we would be ready to go so if you already have a community account and you like to be able to add the promo code in the upper right hand corner once you log into uh, passive total you'll see the little person in the upper right hand corner if you click on account settings we have a section for promo code with a little pencil and if you click on that that's where you can manually add the promo code in so i want to make sure that that you've done that um, we have mike and jacqueline and barrett um, looking at the chat and inside of the chat window i even added the promo code in there and every single slide that we're showing today has the promo code on there. So if you run out of queries, it's probably because you don't have the promo code enabled if you're not an enterprise account. So you might need to go in and add that promo code. Um, so please make sure that you, you see it and you add it to your account. If you're enterprise already, you don't need to add the promo code because you already have uh, the extended queries, the unlimited queries to be able to, to, to search for things. So I'd like to start off by introducing myself. I'm Benjamin Powell. Uh, the technical marketing manager here at Risk IQ, uh, certified ethical hacker. I've been in IT for for over 30 years. Half of my time has been um, managing security teams and, and network teams, database administrators. I've worked in state government, uh, San Diego International Airport, the Port District. Um, uh, worked in education, biotech, financial services, manufacturing, software development. And one fun fact, when I tell this to people, especially in our industry, they, they look at me kind of strange. I my, my hobby is spearfishing. But when I tell that to somebody in security, they always laugh and look at me and never want to accept my emails. But I actually swim out on the ocean and catch fish. So that's one of my fun facts. So now I'd like to introduce Orr, and Orr is going to tell you about himself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Or Schwartz, and I am a solutions architect working in San Francisco for Risk IQ on the West Coast. Um, I think some people who are on here, we've spoken before. Um, I basically am helping right now on strategic accounts, but accounts at large in general on the West Coast. Uh, I've been with Risk IQ for about a year and a half. Previously, was at another threat intel vendor and then different OSINT startups. Um, and then just a fun fact about myself. Um, I actually use Passive Total when I shop online. Sometimes aside from shopping on like Amazon or the big retailers, sometimes you come across dodgy sites and I think Passive Total is a good shopping tool. So anyways, hope you enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Or. So um, what I wanna do is I wanna talk about some of the use cases that we're gonna go through. So Or is gonna lead us off with an advanced investigation. So um, we've got some feedback that, hey, we wanna see some really truly advanced invest investigations. And Or is gonna go through a very hard to detect payment card skimmer. Um, and so this is one of the threat actor groups that are doing some uh, payment card skimming that's um, very difficult to detect. And Or is going to go through that. So it's going to be really, really cool. And he's going to break it down. And inside of um, the attendee window, if you see, if you have a question, you want to stop us anytime, this isn't pre recorded. This is live. And they're really nice um, um, interactions that we can have and answer your questions in person. We, we encourage you to stop us and ask questions. If you don't know something or you want greater detail or why we did something a certain way, uh, raise your hand and we're going to unmute your mic. You ask the question um, just like you were inside an audience. We want to make sure that you're really getting your questions answered and we are um, helping you uh, gain the skills that you might need when you do a threat investigation. The things that we're going to be showing you are live. These are really, really bad things. So I want to make sure that you don't visit these sites directly in your browser. And that's why we're gonna use all the tools that we showed you today is how to do the investigation using other tools. So those tools go out there, grab the data and bring it back to you safely. And there's a buffer between you and the threat actor. It also doesn't trip uh, any wires with the threat actor to let them know that they're under investigation because you're not going there directly. Sometimes the, the threat actor might even have filters in place that you can't visit their site so if you're at a company and you're under attack and you try to go visit the threat actor's site, 
you're fil you might be filtered out and can't get there. So this is a way for you to bypass all of those things that the threat actor might be doing and gain understanding of what's happening. I'm gonna show you how to do some proactive threat hunting um, to leverage information that we've gathered through our mass scanning uh, in the services that we've discovered to see which sites have been duplicated. And then we're gonna take that information and look at um, the IRS stimulus check to see, hey, if somebody was going to attack a COVID site and, and something, a COVID scam, what, what, what might they do? They might want to steal your PII um, so they can uh, potentially get your stimulus check or steal your identity. So we're gonna go through and do one of those live. And then we're gonna go through and look at some uh, exposed services. And, and I picked two that are um, building control um, systems to highlight, but we, if we have more time, um, we have many, many, many more that we can go through. So we're going to make this interactive. Now, the exercises that we're showing you today haven't been put up on our resource site, but they will be after this event. So um, we wanted to make all of the information new from the last time. So if you attended one previously, this is 100% new information that we're gonna be going through. And we're gonna to try to do that for every virtual threat hunting workshop that we do. Now, the next thing I like to do is to, to um, quickly just show a quick little three minute video about Risk IQ if you're new to Risk IQ. Uh, just so you can understand uh, what we do. As attack surfaces grow outside the corporate firewall, cybersecurity teams need to be able to do two things well at scale. Discover unknowns and investigate threats across their organization's digital presence. With attack services expanding quicker and more radically than ever before, and the threat landscape growing along with them, organizations need proactive threat detection that sees their entire digital present for what it really is, and as importantly, never takes a break. For more than 10 years, RiskIQ has been crawling and observing the internet to define the web's composition so we can show customers how they and the attackers targeting them fit inside it. Most organizations attack services unknown to IT teams. It's an in-house shadow IT, assets created by third parties, and assets spun up by threat actors that are purpose-built to attack their Sorry. businesses, employees, and customers. Risk IQ threat detection is unique because it alerts security teams to all of it. Risk IQ maintains a complete inventory of a customer's internet-exposed digital assets and issues alerts as soon as someone in the company stands up something new or something becomes vulnerable or something changes that could indicate a compromise such as a JavaScript on a web page. With our internet-wide visibility, we also alert customers as soon as a threat actor stands up a rogue infrastructure targeting them. For example, a typo squatted domain, phishing pages leveraging their logos, malicious mobile apps, and more. While simulating the actions of real users, RiskIQ's global virtual users network continuously extracts, analyzes, and assembles internet data from the entire IPv4 space covering more ground than any other platform. As we accumulate this data, our proprietary systems are continuously updating each customer's unique intelligence graph and alerting them immediately as vulnerabilities and threats traverse it. By continuously monitoring the entire web at scale with RiskIQ, organizations can reduce personnel resources, improve accuracy, and minimize costs. RiskIQ's unique visibility detects threats and malicious behaviors designed to elude security scanners, such as malware injection, sophisticated website defacement, DNS hijacking, and domain ownership hijacking. By illuminating what were formerly blind assets, RiskIQ allows security teams to put policies against them and gain control. This inventory also helps vulnerability management programs and penetration testing teams to know which assets to evaluate. RiskIQ's proprietary instrumentation and algorithms bring an organization's entire attack service together in one pane of glass. All you need is an internet connection. Continuous encoding, security research, and analysis by RiskIQ's teams of data scientists and threat researchers enable detection of the latest threats targeting businesses. Quick, accurate detection enables fast remediation and proactive blocking of attacks. Over 85,000 security experts 
rely on Risk IQ to safeguard their global digital attack surface with visibility control beyond the firewall. Leveraging our solutions, powered by unmatched internet scale data, our customers discover unknowns and investigate threats. So everyone, I just wanted to let you know that some of the images that you saw in that video are for our platform product that looks at your global inventory, your attack surface. And from that, um, once we know what you look at, look like, we can find people that are targeting you and we can even monitor your assets to see like if a JavaScript changes and things like that. So we're gonna be going through the investigation tool, Passive Total, and um, we're, we'll be jumping into the other product to show you some of the th ways that you can automate it and to make, have faster uh, and quicker incident response um, and improve your, your overall security at your organization. So everything that Risk IQ does is based upon prior experience and knowledge. So um, we gather the data like a real user would. We go out there, we'll perform a search, we present cookies, we keep session, um, we'll grab a few things from, from one place, we'll come from another proxy. And the reason why we have to do this is because when, think of it this way, when you first start off, if you're coming from your own IP space and then you're filtered, now you don't see the bad guys because they're filtering you out. So now everything that we've done um, was because of what we've learned and we gather all this data ourselves. We're not buying these data, this data from other people. They're not feeds. Uh, and because we can gather it, we have this 10 year history of data and um, we're able to roll back and pull out a new data set from the beginning of time when we've been collecting to present. So if, um, for example, we found out that uh, you could use a cookie and illuminate all of the threat actors infrastructure looking at a cookie. So we created that data set and um, added it to our arsenal of ways of finding threat actors. So everything that we do is based upon um, our knowledge and our um, research and data scientists of what they've used to find things. So when we go out there and we, we grab, um, we, we crawl the internet, we do it as a user, we grab the full document object model, all the links, the console meshes, the messages, the cookies, the headers, the dependent requests, the files, uh, and we hash them. And that becomes a hash of that website, what's there, and we can compare that to every other website in the world to find out if anybody is infringing on you and compare similarity. And it's, we use that all the time. Now, we go through the entire IP4 space. Uh, there's over 220 uh, different ports we look at, we preserve when we first see it and when we last see it. So you can see if there's a change. So if you're running a certain version of, of Apache and then you upgraded, you'll see when that ended and when the new one began. So you can actually track over time changes on the internet. We, come, we, we, we use proxy network to come out over 150 countries from commercial, mobile, and residential space. Uh, we act like the intended victim. I always say we act like your parents on the internet. We, we try to get infected. We, we, run the scripts, we see what's happening, uh, and we imitate all of the pop popular browsers and devices and operating systems because the threat actor might be targeting a certain geographic region with a certain device, a certain operating system. And we wanna make sure that we capture all those things. But because we have that full DOM and all that information, even if it doesn't trigger, we still have that data and we're able to analyze it. So, um, with all the ports that we're looking at and, and all the, the per, uh, petabytes of, of data, um, we're able to link this together and create pre-compute maps to figure out the relationships of everything out there, what's coming in and out of every website on the internet. So with that, we can start with a single piece of malware, and then we know which IP addresses are associated with them, the, the certificate that was associated with that um, uh, IP address, and then that certificate was associated with the domain, there were some trackers, and we infrastructure chain all the information out to figure out all these connected uh, assets and how they relate to each other. So with a single ILC, you can unravel and figure out the entire history of this threat actor and the infrastructure that they're using. So now you can, you can use that information to now go into your systems and block it um, or investigate internally to see if anybody went out there. So when we collect this at scale, we're getting the services, the, the client side DOM, um, we're able to find the phishing, the JavaScript. So that comes into our global inventory. And with that, um, we look at over 250,000 newly 
um, new domain resolutions every day. Um, there's over 5.5 million new host resolutions that we see a day, uh, over, over 106 billion total unique DNS records that we have, uh, over 2 billion web uh, requests we're doing today, pulling in data. So we're growing uh, this amount of data that we're collecting um, exponentially over time because of, of what we're gathering in. Um, we're looking at over 300,000 new port observations. Uh, and we one thing we're not even getting into today, we have over 46 million mobile apps that we've downloaded uh, and know how, if they're, they're good or bad. So um, it's incredible the amount of data that we have. Um, and we leverage this to help you. So with that, um, all this data comes in. Um, we have a research team that finds a way to find something. The data scientists take that and move it at the scale to figure out what's happening and put it into um, machine learning algorithms. And with that, we're able to uh, pull out all the traditional data sets that you have, but also create new data sets that no one else has uh, and only available through RiskIQ. So when you think about your organization, most of the money is spent inside where you have control to be able to see what's happening and take action. Um, where we focus is everything outside the firewall. And now with everyone being remote, it's more important than ever to figure out what you have, where people are, and if they're secure or not. And we can usually find things one to four days before they're active. So we can stop things further or, or, or earlier in the kill chain uh, and reduce costs and reduce your exposure and vulnerability uh, and data leakage. So when you think about it, when somebody is going to plan to attack you, they might go on a, a deep and dark web to figure out um, who's trying to attack you. And so we partner with Flashpoint to get the deep and dark web information, to know if they're talking about your organization, asking if there's any compromised assets already in your organization. But then once they register a domain, um, that's where we come in. We, we get all those new domains. We start looking, oh, it's been parked now. Oh, it's now email capable. Oh, now it's it has your logos on there. So now it's domain infringement or it's email capable. So it's now capable of doing phishing. So we can um, find these, uh, stop them. So when we put something on our blacklist, within 10 to 15 minutes, Google and Microsoft immediately put it into production. So 95% of the world's browsers will get the red warning. Do you really want to go there? Um, stop, don't go there. Uh, and then it takes about one to four days to actually do the takedown to bring these things down. So um, that's how it works. But then we also continue to monitor it. So then um, once it gets uh, resolved, if it comes back, we're able to um, see it and we call that tenacious. And we're able then to monitor it uh, once again, put on the blacklist and then do the takedown. So the whack-a-mole of where it moves around, we're able to help you with that and address that. So um, I quickly want to go through and, and talk about the signals that are out there and what happens when you're um, investigating and why it's so important not only to have what our logs are, but your internal logs as well, and um, how those can be used to help you in your investigations. So when, when you think about it, we're all playing on the same battlefield. And so the good guys and the bad guys have to play by the same rules to be on the internet. So with that, if you have a threat actor and you have a target that they're trying to target, they're gonna emit signals. So the threat actor alone, just from connecting to the internet, um, is gonna have an internet IP address, they're gonna be on a net block, autonomous system number, and the internet service provider, just from connecting to the internet. Once they start to do like a phishing email, they're going to have additional information. Their email provider, they're gonna have an email subject, a body, the headers, uh, the language that they wrote it in, or their default language, and then the timestamps of where this happened from. Now, once it goes through the internet, there's going to be transit IP addresses, net blocks, the times, and the autonomous systems that they went through. And then when it gets to the targeted user, there's there might be a a, 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 a verification that they read it. Um, there there might be some HTML that links back so they can fingerprint the information the, the machine. Uh, and get their, their geolocation and other information. So all these are signals that are out there um, that are emitted and that you can capture. But if you don't capture them, um, did it really happen? It's like if a tree fell in the, in the forest, does it make a noise? 
Well, only if you're there do you hear the noise. So the um, the biggest thing to remember is that you know you can't be everywhere all the time. So you we always say that you need um, you need to have some additional information, um, not just one solid analytical lead. We always say about three to really make a good determination. Otherwise, it might be a suspect, or you need to you need to continue to monitor it. So these global um, sensors that we have that are gathering data and the crawlers out there allow us to have the passive DNS, that's the IP address for that domain at that moment in time, the who is information, uh, the search, the trackers, the host pairs, uh, what's coming in and out of the, the website, uh, the cookies, the hashes, open source intelligence, that's a paid Google search that when you search for something, we also go out there and grab that information so it stays in one place. Uh, we have the document object model, so in our other platform products, you can actually see the full DOM, uh, the headers, the console logs, the open ports, and, and now we have it exposed services inside of uh, passive total for the enterprise users. So with these solid analytical leads, it's, an, it's important to make sure that you have multiple um, points of proof to really make sure that you're determining if something's good or bad. Um, now, all of the things that we're doing, you could be doing as well in collecting these logs and understanding what's happening and, and merging this data together. So we have a, a partnership with CrowdStrike that when you um, enable um, Risk IQ in the CrowdStrike Falcon, it will automatically query your Falcon instance for the endpoint and Intel to bring that in. So you get the inside and the outside perspective at the same time. So um, you really need to make sure that when, when you go through and you do these, these investigations, that you're doing it safely. And so when we are doing these today, please bear in mind, don't directly go to these websites uh, because these are actively bad things that we're gonna be showing you, or they've been cleaned up um, very, very um, like within a few days ago or a week yeah. ago. So just be careful, okay? So I'm gonna quickly go through the different data sets and then we're gonna jump right in. So I'm giving everybody enough time to get the promo codes and everything ready. So I hope everybody is, is, is ready to go. So with traditional data sets, this is what most security people um, are used to seeing. Um, the IP address of what was resolving to a domain, the passive DNS information. Who is information? DNS records, the, the MX, um, uh, the start of authority, all those different things. So when you look at some of the data today, you might see a um, 10 address or you might see a loopback address. And the reason for that is when we look at the who is record, it gives us a DNS um, that's associated with it. We go pull all the records from that DNS server. So there, a threat actor might be staging something and have it in a loopback. And then they turn it on for a day or so, and then they turn it back off. And so it's this cat and mouse game. So uh, we actually grab all that data. So you might see um, a public IP address or uh, a, a, a non-routable IP address or one that might be both on the same day. Uh, the subdomains and the hashes um, were all the traditional data sets. And now the additional data sets that Risk IQ has because we gather this data ourselves or all the certificates for everything on the internet that we've talked to. We have 10 years of history. Trackers, um, these are all the, um, um, the bits of code that might be using or the tracking information that an application might use to say where it got something from. And that's the HTTP track that we're gonna go through today. The host pairs are the parent-child relationship. So I might be pulling an image in from uh, Facebook and sending out data to Google Analytics. So we have this map of the internet and we already pre-computed all the relationships. So we know from a script being run from one place to, a, to data being sent out, we know what's being sent, brought in and taken out and all the web components. So what's kind of installed and running and that's a combination of examining the website and looking at the, the, the headers and the services. So just because the uh, port 21 is open, it doesn't really mean that it's FTP. You have to look at the headers as well. So we look at those to be able to get really good actual information to understand what your services are and exposures 
and what things we see that are running, and then also the cookies. Any questions so far before we, we jump in? I'm quickly looking. So Barrett, are there any questions? Yeah, Benjamin, there was a question uh, about what kinds of sensors you were talking about and whether or not they were hardware based. Well, they're, 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 it's not hardware based, but it's, it's VMs that are running or, or servers that are running. So um, looking at all the passive DNS information, so we have sensors that, that might be gathering passive information, uh, passive DNS information, and then we also partner with other organizations to take their information we share with them and they share with us. And so when we go through and we query something, we'll show you where the data came from. So you're, you'll notice that when we run some of these queries, um, there'll be a column to show you risk IQ or it might be um, uh, Pingli or other organizations. So that's some of the sensors. Um, also when we're doing our, our mass scanning and things like that, so there's different tools that we're using uh, to go out there and gather that or passively receive data. Gotcha. Thanks, great, Benjamin. Great question. Thanks. So, so we um, had go ahead. one other question. Uh, did GDPR change the type of passive who is history that you are allowed to store? So with um, we have a history of data that goes back pretty far. So when um, um, we have some history data that was prior to GDPR, uh, way prior to GDPR. So sometimes when it's been, um, when we're looking at a record today, it might be privacy protected. But um, three years ago, that site was still up and it wasn't privacy protected. We might have some records for that. So we do have some uh, information and that's generally through uh, the product, but you have to have a paid uh, license to, to see the history with it. So sometimes when you look at it and you go, oh, there's no history. If you're an enterprise, um, um, uh, if you're licensed for the enterprise product, you might have access for additional information like the exposed services. Okay, Got it. so um, yep, all set. anything else? No, good to go. Thanks, Benjamin. Okay. So, I'm going to go into the use cases. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and Orr is going to take over for, for a minute. So give me a quick second. I'm going to go to sharing and stop sharing my screen. Cool. And I should be able to. No, Benjamin, it's not letting me take the screen here. Oh, you have to change presenter. Okay, let me put myself here. Okay, cool. Um, so the first use Wait, case just yet. Yeah, just a second. So kind of just to preface this, um, with everything that Benjamin said, one of the main things that we're able to look at as part of this mass scanning and mass crawling that we're doing um, is JavaScript. So one of the capabilities that we have as part of the crawling that we're doing is the ability to execute client-side code. Um, so when we're using our virtual uh, browsers, we are navigating the different websites just as a normal user would, as uh, Benjamin explained. And we execute client-side code, and we're able to look at all the different sources of code that's presentable to any other normal user. Um, one of the things that we're specifically looking at is JavaScript. So our intent for being able to look at JavaScript is essentially being able to find uh, skimming telemetry. So one of the major threat actor groups that we've been tracking over uh, the past, um, pretty much since the inception of Risk IQ, is MageCart. Right? MageCart is a threat actor group uh, that uses various uh, scripts to essentially uh, steal credit card data from retail sites. Now that presents itself in different ways. 
It could be instances where the code is visible on the entire site, on different pages. It could be more highly targeted attacks and more unique attacks where the script is only um, presentable on the checkout page, right? The only intent of the uh, script being placed on the site is to steal the payment data. Now, Passive Total is a tool that you can use as a result of specifically when Benjamin spoke about host pairs. That's us collecting the, the document object model from a site, um, parsing it, and then indexing it, meaning we're looking at all the different URLs and hosts, domains that are being called out within that document object model, um, and we're parsing them and indexing them within passive total. Um, so what we'll run through today is we are, I'm prefacing this that we're starting off with a known bad, but we'll get to a stage where we'll look at a couple sites that we'll see that via the host pairs section, they are sourcing scripts from hosts that may seem generic, may seem familiar, are intended to look as normal, but in fact they're tied to infrastructure that's associated with Maychart with skimming. Um, and then I'll show you information as well, um, telemetry from our back end, from an actual crawl that you don't necessarily see in passive total. Uh, but it's kind of the heart of our capability where you're able to see the actual um, script, the, the, the JavaScript resource URL that's being called within the document object model of the website. Um, and then in addition to that, the actual script content, content of that uh, JavaScript URL. Um, and then what we'll do, we'll pivot to a few tools that are uh, free um, and available to everyone. Um, and we'll use them to decode some Base64 uh, encoded uh, uh, code that we found on one of the sites. Um, and we'll use, also use it to de-obfuscate uh, JavaScript that's obfuscated. Um, now, the intent of showing you this as part of a webinar um, is to A, obviously show you the capabilities of data that we have, but B, it, it could be a tool that you use as responders, as security operations individuals, protecting your websites and your organizations that when you run through this information on passive total, having an eye out for aspects that seem foreign, and then also understanding what is the background that may be occurring there. At face value, um, if you are not familiar with your website, an individual may see the, the these certain hosts being sourced and maybe think that they're benign, maybe not give too much thought for them. What we what I want you to guys to get out of this is the ability to look at the uh, minute details from within the crawl data and the data that we're presenting in passive total, and then be able to take it a few steps further um, and then understand what is the nature of that host or those foreign sources being used in the website. Um, sure. Can I, yeah. can I just one thing? So what I did was in the chat, so if you go to the go to webinar control panel and you go to the chat section, um, I posted links to all of the tools that we're going to be doing so you don't have to Google them. Uh, they're all listed there. And then I also gave the first initial query that OR is going to be doing. And so what you can do is as OR goes through this, um, run the query, follow along and see how he does it. So then um, you can see what happens. Okay. Right. And then what I'm going to do is I have all my tabs pre-populated. I'll tell you where I would click, but I have them all pre-loaded, so we don't need to waste time with page loading and, and potentially slow internet. Um, so starting this off, our first starting point for the investigation is this IP address 185-195-26147. Now, this is, again, as I said previously, a, a starting point for us, which is known bad. Um, and then I'll talk to that idea of either starting with a known bad or starting with something that's an unknown in general um, a little bit later. And like I mentioned, our goal here is to identify any type of hosts that are being sourced that are not recognizable, not familiar, um, and then reach the conclusion of, oh, okay, 
is the site, if we are assuming that a couple of sites that we're showing today, if we were responsible for their security, can we come to a conclusion that says, uh, is it affected by MageCard or some sort of uh, credit card skimming uh, technique at large? Um, what are the scripts actually doing? Um, and has the infrastructure proliferated to other websites? Is it affecting other websites that may be mine, may not be mine, may be my partner's, but you get an understanding of the nature of the attack. So with that, let me switch to my browser. And Benjamin, can you just confirm that you see my passive total? I see your screen, yes. Okay, wonderful. So what we have here, this is the first URL that we're looking at, right? And this is the IP address that we just mentioned within passive total. So getting a quick look at it, we can see uh, we first viewed this IP address um, in March 2018 um, and as recent as the 4th of June. And one potential indicator that it's based in Russia, maybe something that helps us, maybe not. And we can see on this heat map is these are resolutions per day. So each one of these little boxes is represents a time period of a day. And on here, we can see the different domains that have been resolving to this IP. Um, and each little orange marker that we have here are new unique resolutions that we've identified. Or can, now, I, we'll, can, I, can yeah. I ask you something? So can you mention about the analyst insights? Because people that are the free community users won't know what that is. Right, so what we have here at the top, these analyst insights that are basically a drop down here. Um, you will not have this if you are a community user. This is a function of a paid user. Um, and what these are are quick um, tidbits of information that when you quickly look at and initially look at some sort of indicator, we are highlighting these pieces of metadata. For example, we can see this IP address, it's been blacklisted. It gives us an indication that there's already some negative nature that has to do with this IP. Um, it's not a Tor exit node. Uh, a, a open port was detected 12 days ago. It's not a proxy. Uh, host last observed 24 days ago. It hosts a web server. So this gives us an idea as to what is the nature of this indicator that we're looking at very quickly. Um, it's color coded, right? So the things that you need to read are in blue and red and the things that you don't need to re read are shaded. So this is a function of a paid user that just gives you more information upon the first look. Does that help, Benjamin? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Cool. So what we're gonna specifically focus on for this use case um, is being able to see these resolutions in this first tab down here where we see there's a total of 36 resolutions over the time that we've analyzed and observed this IP. Um, and what we can see here, we scroll down, different domains that have been resolving to this IP. Now, since we know already that this is an infrastructure that's associated with MageCard, it's kind of easy to make the assumption that some of these are probably bad, right? But if we didn't know that, you can kind of see here that there are domains that may attempt to look normal, but may not if you have familiarity, right? So we see things that relate here to JS, JavaScript. This is .cloud. This has API in it, CDN. Um, we have JS, JS, CDN. The idea here is we can quickly get an understanding that this IP may be related to information that is used, right, for potentially JavaScript, right, JS, uh, API, content delivery network. Okay, makes sense. If we didn't know that was bad, gives us an idea. Maybe this has some sort of infrastructure associated with it. Kind of a weak conclusion, but nonetheless. Um, and we can all see that these are fairly recent, right? All They're all from May in terms of the last scene. Um, and we specifically chose that as sources as well. The, What's that? Can you? Somebody had asked the question about the the DNS and and like our sensors. Can you? And I mentioned about like how we we show where our sources came from. So can you? Right. Can you mention that as well? Yeah. So we're transparent about where we're sourcing the data. You could see that 
Um, some of these, in terms of the data that we have about them, are coming from virus total, um, and some of these are coming from us as well. So in cases where we, we, we obviously attempt to crawl the entire internet, we definitely don't do that, right? The internet's vast and we're open and transparent about that. Um, in cases like that, we're sourcing data from our partners, from companies that we work with, and then we are listing that in terms of the source so it is transparent from where that data is coming from. Thanks, thanks. So what we'll specifically focus on here um, is the second domain resolution that we're seeing here, cdnpack.net. Now, when you view this, again, if you are not familiar, you can maybe make the assumption that this has something to do with content delivery network, um, potentially providing content to websites. Um, but it's a .NET domain. It doesn't look like something that may be familiar if you are familiar with your website and the sources that's bring, uh, that are being brought into the page. And we're gonna specifically focus on this one. When I initially did this investigation, this immediately caught my eye because I said, okay, this looks kind of crafty, right? This looks like something that could be looked at as generic or benign. And that the fact that it was attempting to do that kind of caught my attention and then I drilled down on that. So in the next tab, I have the pivot on cdnpack.net. And again, with the analyst insights, you see these two red buttons, right? It's been blacklisted three months ago. The IP we were just looking at is blacklisted as well. Um, and we'll specifically focus here on the host pairs. But before that, we can see the resolution of this domain has not been consistent, all right? That's another flag immediately to the eye. It says, okay, something weird going on here. If it was a normal, potentially content delivery source, wouldn't we expect it to be up consistently and constantly? Otherwise, it's not a reliable source for content delivery. Another potential red flag. Um, what we're looking at here, aside from all these other tabs that we have here, like I mentioned initially, um, is host pairs. Host pairs, as Benjamin mentioned, parent-child relationship between the website and sources that are brought in uh, depending on what the source is. So we can see in this case, cdnpack.net is being sourced from this site, caddydaddy.com, for scripts. And we can see that this has first been observed in March 2020 and as of recent in May uh, 8th. Um, so this gives us a quick understanding in this case that Caddy Daddy, potentially orderline.com, but we'll leave that alone as well, um, were two initial targets that cdnpack.net was used against, right? Now in this case, again, we still haven't made the conclusion that cdnpack.net, because that's part of the, the goal of the investigation, but we can see it affects this website caddydaddy.com. Um, so the next pivot that we'll do here is investigate what is caddydaddy.com. I have this in our next tab here, um, and I'll come up here and give you a look at how it first looks. So there's no red buttons at the top. It's not blacklisted. Uh, there's been a new subdomain four days ago. It's registered. We, we crawled it, it resolved. We can see a consistent pattern of resolutions to the IP, which gives us an idea um, that this has this site has been up and is potentially legitimate. Um, and now, again, I'm specifically focusing on this case within our data set on host pairs. So we saw that there was a connection to cdnpack.net, and we can confirm that looking at the host pairs. And we can see things that uh, look legitimate here as well, like translate.google.com and paypal.com and googleanalytics.com. These are the, the legitimate sources being used in this website. And if we come down here, we can see the relationship of cdnpack.net from April to May, right? So it confirms what we saw in the previous screen, which is fantastic. Now, just to get an idea of what caddydaddy.com was, I initially did some Google searches and I was led to this parts store for Cadillac, uh, custom Cadillac parts, that is not far from where I live in Napa, California. So this looks to be uh, a legitimate website, right, that's selling different car parts for Cadillacs for people who are customizing Cadillacs. Okay, fantastic, right? We know what this site is. 
Now, the next part of this is when we look at the host pairs, from the view that we get from passive total is a broken down document object model. That's essentially how I view the host pairs. Now, this is a result, as we've been mentioning previously, of risk IQ crawling Caddy Daddy throughout the past year and collecting the telemetry, indexing it, parsing it, um, and then recognizing any changes. What I'll do now is I'm pivoting out of passive total to be able to show you how we view the document object model in its raw form from caddydaddy.com and how we can see that cdnpack.net is being called out to as a JavaScript resource and then we'll analyze, we'll look at the actual script content of cdnpack.net within Caddy Daddy. So I'm pivoting again, as I mentioned, to our back end. Um, and this is uh, the result of our crawl on caddydaddy.com. I specifically have highlighted here, like I'll just scroll down and give you an idea. This is all the code that we've collected from the DOM. And I'm specifically highlighting this section right here of the JavaScript source. We can see HTTPS, cdnpack.net slash cdn.js. This is how in passive total, when we crawled this website, we saw that cdnpack.net was the resource URL for this JavaScript resource. And then we've listed that as a host pair. So again, there is a certain gap of what you can see from our back end, obviously. Um, and then what you see in passive total. Um, I just want to give you an idea of how this looks and then what you can then do if you have this capability to be able to look at the actual script content. Or can I ask one thing? So we yeah. don't use any, any agents installed anywhere on any machines to go gather this. This is all from us acting like the real user uh, and interacting with the website like a real user, correct? A hundred percent. This is us consistently visiting the site of caddydaddy.com as a normal user would, um, emulating normal human behavior um, and collecting the information that we get from that interaction. Thanks, thank you. So now the next thing that we need to do is we need to understand what is the, what is the nature, what is the content of this JavaScript resource that we see is related to cdnpack.net. So the cool thing about our collection is we actually collect this script content. And I'll pivot to another tab where we have the actual uh, script content of this cdn.js file that's being sourced in Caddy Daddy. If I go up here, a lot of text, a lot of code, gives you an idea of the full amount that we have here. Now specifically, what we have down at the bottom, which is a common trait for credit card skimming attacks, is to uh, have the code that's related to the skimming activity at the bottom of the DOM. Now what we see here is that there is some sort of encoding being done, being used as part of this script. So in this section that I've highlighted, this is what we're specific specifically going to focus on in terms of the bad aspect of this script resource. Um, so we can see it starts with the var right here and then goes all the way down to the end of the script. Now one technique that our researchers use here is decoding this script, right? And for that what we can do is use an online tool where we'll pull these individual unique values that we see here and here. We'll remove the quotes and the uh, commas and we'll put these actual values, we parse them, and we'll put them in a uh, free online tool that does base64 decoding, right? So this, this script has been encoded, we wanna decode it and understand what the actual values that this script is looking for. Um, so if we pivot to a free tool, base64. So, so or can I ask one thing? So yeah. we automate this to find this automatically for customers, but what we're showing is a manual process on how to do it, um, to show you what it would take for you to do it on your own. Uh, but we actually have a product that does this for you and monitors it automatically. Uh, but what we're showing you is a manual process to do it and what you would have to do as a threat investigator to do this. 
Correct, 100%. So what we've done is um, parse that code, right? We remove the uh, individual um, characters of the, the quotes and the commas. And I've structured it specifically here, line by line with these uh, different indicators. We put it into this section here that you put in the raw code, hit decode. And then what we can see is the true values of this encoded text. So if we look here, these first values that we see at the top relate to last name, email, street number, region ID. So this is the different type of information that the text, that the code is looking for and then skimming, i.e. taking it away, sending it off to somewhere else. Where it's sending it off to, the drop server domain in this case, is cdnpath.net. So whoever's controlling this domain is having this information being identified by this script for these certain parameters of information, and then it gets sent to cdnpath.net. If we continue down here, there's a public key that we see here. And there's more information that relates to payment information, right? We could see CC number, credit card number, um, expiration dates, the month and year, the CVV code, right? So this is all information that when you have it in your, right, when we all shop online, this is a different type of information that you put into um, a checkout process, right? Your address, your personal information, your actual specific credit card details, and then you hit checkout, that information gets routed to the retailer, your credit card gets charged, and then you receive the product eventually, right? So in this case, this script is looking for this information, harnessing it, sending it out to a different origin, um, different destination, rather, um, and then the information gets stolen from the user to a threat actor, which then can go make fraudulent charges, can take the PII for other uses, identity theft potentially. Um, but it's a cool way to then, to, if, if we just kind of uh, recap, we started off with cdnpact.net. We saw I had a relationship on the website. We specifically looked at the nature of the uh, DOM. We specifically looked at the nature of the script being called out. And we see now that the indicators within the script are looking for PII and then credit card details. Now, the next thing that we want to do is we want to see, so we, we can conclude in this case that there is some sort of uh, attack going on here, some sort of infection on the website that is not, that is an irregular source that's being source cdnpack.net on the website that may seem unfamiliar to us if we're the owner of the website. Um, and then when we unpack the code and look at it, at its content, it's sourcing for information that it shouldn't be, right? If this was a C, real CDN uh, resource, why is it pulling the, why is it identifying the credit card information as part of the, its behavior on the website? So our first uh, objective to understand whether uh, our site, caddydaddy.com, is affected by credit card skimming activity, highly likely in this case. The next part that we want to do is see if this attack has proliferated, has it moved somewhere else, has it changed nature, um, is it affecting other sites? So what we do here is we're coming back to our search and passive total of Caddy Daddy, right? This is the main uh, section that we saw the information relating to that website. Now, what we're doing here is we're coming down to the date that cdnpack.net was used, was being sourced as a script resource for the site. And what we can see is another weird looking domain here, cdnn2ns-aws.com. I know AWS domains, doesn't look like this is something that's familiar. CDN with two Ns hyphen AWS looks irregular, but potentially another attempt by the threat actor using a domain like this that at first glance you see AWS.com and potentially make a slip and assume that this is something normal. And we can see that it's it started being sourced on the same day as CDNpack.net. And then over time, cdnpack.net was dropped. So it transitioned 
for one day to cdnn-aws.com. Kind of weird, right? If this was a legitimate CDN, again, source, when we expect to see it consistently being used on the website. Now, this is the second part of our investigation where we're pivoting to new infrastructure to be able to see proliferation and movement of the attack. So as Benjamin initially mentioned, um, infrastructure chaining is sort of the core uh, intent of what we're doing here via passive total as responders, as investigators, as threat hunters, as researchers, whatever it may be. You need to be able to look at this information, identify pieces that seem irregular, pivot on them, and then find more infrastructure. So as we started, we started off with an IP that we knew was associated with, with badness. We were looking at what domains resolved to the IP, right, cdmpack.net, and then we saw what relationships does cdmpack.net have with other infrastructure, and we got to Caddy Daddy. We're gonna do the same thing here with CDNN uh, hyphen aws.com. Before we start the second part, are there any questions? Benjamin, should we do a question check? Yeah, there was a question. Um, any dam, uh, demo of the manual automated process of the JavaScript code deobfuscation after beautifying it? It looks like only the base64 encoding string was covered. Were there any other ones that we need to cover, or is that? So that's what we're gonna do in this next se section. In this next section, in this next part of the investigation, we're actually going to deobfuscate the code that we see from cdnnaws.com. So preempted me a little bit, but we'll get there. Just a few okay, minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so with that, yeah. Can I just it? So somebody had a question about, hey, they couldn't follow along. The SF part is our backend system, and that's kind of what our, our platforms use to gather this data in and take action on it. So that's like um, the, the raw data of what we've gathered. So you don't have access to that, but when, she, when I show you my piece, you'll see how it comes into the platform um, when, right. in the enterprise products. But we're just trying to show you with the raw data what happens and how we can take it and deobfuscate it to show you the manual process to do it instead of just doing hitting one button, it's all done, here it is. So we're showing you how to hunt and gather on your own, and that's what we're, we're attempting. Correct, we're aware that we're showing you a piece here that's in our back end. Um, however, this is something that you can actually go to Caddy Daddy, if, if, if this is current, you could go to the website, and even within a browser, look at the actual document object model and look at the specific resource that's being sourced from cdnpack.net, and then be able to look at the potential script content that's being called there. So there's ways to do it. We obviously showed you just from our back end to show you the view of how we view it and then how we index and parse that data within it and make it viewable and how it manifests itself um, within passive total. So there are steps here of information that you may not have access to. This is intended to be an illustration of when you see something foreign, how can you then dig in and understand what the nature of it is and why could it be something that needs investigation in general? So the next part here, cdnn-aws.com. Let's pivot on this specific domain, right? So again, same kind of lookup. We see first seen um, in, in January, last seen uh, June 24th, so yesterday. Again, resolving IP blacklisted, um, and we can see potentially some sort of timeline here that looks like uh, normal behavior. It's been up. We can see two domain IP resolu two uh, IP resolutions over time. Maybe this is a little bit more consistently used uh, compared to the previous one. Um, okay, conclusion there. Now, again, specifically here, focusing on the host pairs tab. What we want to see is what other relationships does cdnn-aws.com have with other websites, with other hosts? So what we can see here under host pairs, we have 13 entries. These 13 entries, if we only focus on the ones in the past recent months, we can see uh, a checkout, supatx.com, Godspeed Project, Computer Orbit, um, Facebook.net, we'll leave that out, buypcsupplies.com, and rev9power.com. So on the face of it, I don't know what all these websites are, but we can see that this resource is being used, being sourced in other websites, right? 
So if I pivot on this first one, the checkout.supertx.com here, I, I'm trying to get an, an understanding of what these uh, hosts are, what are these domains, what are these websites, and then see what is the relationship with cdnn-aws.com as I did previously with Caddy Daddy. So I'll pivot to uh, the SupaTX uh, site. So this looks a little bit more normal, right? I have a, a full history of resolutions over time with not much change that I can see in this heat map. Um, the resolving IP is blacklisted. That may be an indicator here. Um, may not be. It may be that at some point, one of the IPs that this domain was using was associated with some sort of reputational data that was negative and it's been classified as blacklisted. Can be and may not be. So again, let's go to host pairs where we can actually see that CDN, the, the domain that we're looking at, is being sourced as recently as the 24th as a script resource. So this is simply confirming what we saw before. Now let's get an understanding of what, what is this site. So I initially Googled this, and then I come and I see that this retail store um, is uh, selling uh, SUPs, right? So uh, these boards that you stand on, and they're like a hybrid of a surfboard where you go slow and stand on them. Okay, fantastic. I know that it's a retail site where there is a shopping cart and uh, financial transactions can be conducted. So now again, just for uh, transparency, I'm pivoting out of passive total and again going to our back end to show you how we view the relationship that we're manifesting here in terms of host pairs, how it looks for us in the back end, how we view the actual document object model of this site when we crawled it with our, our virtual users. So if we go to our back end, this is our site checkout.supertx that we saw. Uh, it's actually SUPA, right? SUPATX.com that we saw um, in passive total. And I have done a quick control F and I can see our resource here, cdnaws.com is hosting a resource, which is I-N-I-T init.js. So again, as we've collected this, we parse out cdnaws.com and then we list that as a host pair in passive total, right? So this is how we got to identifying that this may be something bad. Um, the next part of this is as we did with cdnpack.net is I wanna understand what is the nature of this JavaScript? What is it actually hosting? What is it delivering? What is the nature of the script? So as we did previously, we actually collected the script content of the JavaScript. And in this case, a shorter piece of code that we see here compared to the one that was on the uh, caddydaddy.com site. So in this case, this uh, JavaScript um, is obfuscated. So what we can do is we can put it in a tool that we linked to at the beginning, which is a JavaScript beautifier. It breaks down the uh, code and makes it more structured where we can actually see the uh, different functions and the, 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 the nature of the script set up correctly in a way where it's easier to read. Um, and what we can do here is we can look at the nature of the script and a specific piece here, which is uh, raises a red flag, is we have a string here, which has the same base 64 encoding that we saw in the cdnpack.net um, resource. So again, what we can do here is take this specific string specific piece of text right here, L9, all the way to this equals equals, put that back in our tool, hit decode, and we're seeing that this is our, essentially our drop server domain that may be sending the information to a, the, the, the domain owner. Now, in this case, we don't see that this specific JavaScript is looking for the same parameters of information as our first one did, right? We don't see here any indicators that look at credit cards. We don't see any PII indicators here. So this is kind of weird, right? Why is there just a, um, a component here that relates to our drop server domain in this case? What we have here, 
we had our researchers look at this. And basically this is a different type of skimming technique that only includes uh, one stage of the skimmer. Now this could usually be intended to only fire off within the checkout page, meaning once a user goes through the checkout on that sub board site and starts adding information, another stage of the JavaScript gets loaded and that's where it will contain the actual skimmer. So in this case, if this is a two stage mage cart attack where um, if you don't go through the checkout process, you may not see the actual skimmer. You see components of it, but you may not see the actual nature of it. It's intended to potentially be uh, a little bit more stealthy, maybe more undetectable, um, or simply that the way that the, the, the threat actor crafted this attack is to only operate on the checkout page. Um, so a different nature of the attack that we saw in cdnpack.net, right? And then this one that they then transition this infrastructure to, to, to use this new domain, the, the skimmer has a different nature. The other one was viewable at first scan, at first uh, without needing to go through another action, without the user requiring to go through another action. Um, in this case, the user actually needs to go into the checkout page, put information in, go through the, the process of adding different PII and credit card data, and then a second stage of the attack gets loaded. So it's a two-stage attack. Um, now, going back to passive total, let's see what other sites this, um, this domain, cdnn-aws.com, is affecting, right? We see this list here, checkout, super TX. Okay, we can say that's potentially affected, right? What is godspeedproject.com? So again, pivot to that, open this in passive total, same deal, look like a legitimate website. It is blacklisted. Now for our intents and purposes, it's blacklisted because we actually found Magecart on this site. Let's assume it wasn't blacklisted previously and you're doing your investigation. Um, this looks like a legitimate website, right? Consistent uh, resolutions over time, consistent uptime. Um, we look at the host pairs here again. We're looking at different sources, right? So googleapis.com, google.com, facebook.com, and then here is our target that we're looking at as of the 23rd. So now the next thing I did is again, I Googled Godspeed project. I see that this sells uh, the car parts, suspension parts, coil overs specifically that they create for suspensions. Cool, I know it's a retail site. Next part, again, we'll go through the same process of looking at our crawl from Godspeed project and we have the same type of script init.js being called out to. We can conclude that there is major potentially skimming activity occurring on godspeedproject.com, just like we saw with the site for the subboards. Now let's go back to our next resolution here that we saw, the next, uh, sorry, rather relationship, computerorbit.com. Again, same deal, looks like a potentially legitimate site, does have the blacklisted since we, we, we scanned it and we've identified the skimmer operating on this site. Um, but again, same deal, right? Uh, legitimate sources being used here, but then we have our one foreign one. And just to understand the nature of the site, I can see that it's a retail site selling computer parts. Fantastic. Let me look at the document object model that we've collected as well. Same deal. Uh, same deal, we have the JavaScript being sourced here. Um, and then we'll go to another post that we saw the relationship with, bypcsupplies.com. Again, same process, looks legitimate, has legitimate sources, contains a relationship with our, our target um, domain here. And then we're able to look at the fact that it, it's also a retail site, and then look at the document object model and see that it's being sourced in the same, the same resources being sourced. Um, so that pretty much concludes these two different types of um, investigations that we have here. So let me just pivot to my PowerPoint presentation here. So Barrett, are there any questions that have come up uh, with us? Because this is an advanced investigation. So we wanted to show you something where we took a known bad, 
And from that known bad through infrastructure chaining and from the advanced data sets that Risk IQ has because we know the pre-computed map of the internet because we know what comes in and goes out of all the websites to find something that is also affected. And one of them was already cleared up. You can see that it was no longer, we've seen that script being run there. But then we pivoted from that one to find current ones that are currently being affected. So um, we're showing you a manual process and we were showing you tools that you would have to, that you could use to potentially get this work done. But you have to also remember that if you're using um, a, a checkout or something like that, that you're relying upon somebody else's code, they might get popped and you get popped because you're using them. One thing is if you're buying something online, it's a lot safer to use something like PayPal where your credit cards are already stored and then you're using that checkout to do it where your information is not sent um, through, the, um, through the website and you're not, um, you're not inadvertently having your PI stolen your credit card information. Um, so those are some things that you can think about. Now, Barrett, are there any questions that have come up since, since we've, we've ended this? Uh, yep. yep. Benjamin, there's one around host pairs, and maybe you guys can elaborate a little more on this. Uh, can you help clarify the relationship between the parent and the child? You want to take this, or what is considered the parent and the child? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the, um, so basically, what we're seeing is there's uh, two relationships between the host, right? So um, Benjamin, correct me, right? The parent is sourcing from the child. Is that correct? So, so think of it this way. If I search for something, there's a parent and child relationship. So the parent comes in and the child goes out. But if I, if I, it depends on what you're searching because then if I search whatever was that parent to begin with, there might, the, the relationships might change. So it's always in the perspective of what you have searched. But the way that I was taught was, um, it's like your parent tells you what to do and you can tell your child what to do. So it's kind of that flow where, um, you reach out, you grab the parent, it comes in, and then you might be sending out something to the child. Right. And again, the intent of this, of dis displaying this whole process um, and showing aspects that you may not have access to is if you are one of the owners of caddydaddy.com or any of these other ones that we looked at, you are more familiar with the different sources being used on that site than we are, than an outsider is. You surely know all the different sources um, and behaviors that the website exhibits and uses. Um, and then when you come across something that is unknown, that is new, how do you take that investigation and take it a couple levels deep? Whether you use you know, help from us, whether it's information that you can gather on your own via different tools, how do you come to the conclusion that some aspect that you see here that is unknown may potentially be bad, negative in nature, and then what is the actual nature, right? It may be bad, but what type of badness is it? In this case, um, it's an, it, these are scripts that are essentially just stealing credit card information, right? It's, it's typical cyber crime, it's theft of payment information that somebody can then go and use for their own benefit. So we, we had a great question. Somebody asked about the first and last seen dates. So when we go out there and we crawl the internet, if somebody put a script on there, and we saw it and then they took it off and we went back and it was gone that's like a first last scene but sometimes somebody can put a script on and we already had scanned them and then by the time we come back it's gone we might never see it that's like the tree falling in the woods does it make a noise um but generally when you see that first and last date and if it's no longer after that last date that's generally when it was cleaned up so um you can tell when the site was affected and when it was cleaned based upon when we detected that that script, for example, being used. Uh, great question. And then one other aspect that we have as passive total users, you can actually establish uh, monitors and alerts on change of infrastructure. So if we're looking, for example, at an IP and there's a new domain resolution, as one of the bonus questions we had here is like what features can be used to monitor changes in infrastructure. So we have an alerting mechanism on passive total that can alert you to changes in infrastructure 
Um, you have the ability to create projects, which are essentially case files. So you can add this infrastructure, establish monitors on it, and then rather than manually tracking its, its updates or its deltas, you will get an alert that will notify you that a change has been occurred. And Benjamin, I've stopped sharing, so you can take over from here. Okay, so give me a quick second, just... Okay, and I'm gonna bring up my slides real quick. So the, the next one I want to go through is I want to talk about um, taking a known good. So we did one with a known bad. So I want to start off with a known good, and I want to find bad stuff that might be targeting a known good place. So because we're all working remote and because of COVID has affected everyone, um, I wanted to take and highlight like a COVID scam, okay? So um, in here, what I wanted to do was uh, if you're if you're from the U.S., the the United States government has had, had done economic impact checks, and they the IRS said, hey, if you filed taxes last year, um, we will send you out a stimulus check, but you need to go and check to make sure we have your direct deposit, we have your information, um, so and you can see track the status of your check uh, and see if you um, when it's due to be sent to you or if, if you're not eligible. Um, so I wanted to take that as a known good and try to find something bad associated with it. So when I when I thought about this, because I wanted to make this like a real life experience, I go, what would a threat actor use um, to duplicate a website? So in the past, I've done things where we talked about Mark of the Web, where if I use like IE, I can download a website offline and Microsoft will put a watermark in there that would say, mark of the web and it will give me this the host domain and the full url path of what was copied where it came from um, but there's another tool out there um, called htt track and this is a tool that people use legitimately i've used it in my um, lifetime to duplicate a website um, now if you use this at your organization to move something from development to qa to production it will sometimes bleed out information that you don't want available because it might have host name information or IP address uh, uh, name uh, schema or uh, IP address numbers that were where these, these um, websites were hosted. But the threat actor going out there and duplicating your, um, your legitimate domain uh, to do a phishing campaign or domain infringement or something um, will leave these breadcrumbs. And because of our crawling capability and be, through the um, looking at the exposed services and the web components and merging this together, we're able to um, find these. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to temporarily just stop sharing because I want to, to give out these, these particular um, searches for you so you can have them. OK, so I'm going to paste into the chat now. Give me a second. Um, two different URLs. The very first one um, we're going to do right now, I'm going to bring it up. Let me go back. Okay. Give me a quick second. A new window. Okay, so I'm I'm going to run this search. So what this search is is I'm looking for a component HTT track a version 3.x, and I see that there's 83,000 domains that we found this on, and there's over 183,000 websites. Now this is a legitimate tool. Um, there's nothing um, malicious about this tool. It's used to duplicate a, a website and publish it someplace. So um, threat actors are using it because it's a free tool, freely available. And um, I'm just gonna click on one real quick. So uh, Ohio government, okay? And um, we'll look at this track and there's the trackers, there's a ton in here. Um, there's a document, I'm looking to see if I can quickly find it. There's so many in this one. Let me find a different one. Um, give me a quick second, let's do, um, I'll pick the first one on the list. 18, a lot better number. So here's all these HTT track 
websites okay that have been copied so it lists them out there these are the the source of where they came from okay um so what we're going to do is i'm going to show you how to edit this url so instead of just doing it and finding anything related to a domain i want to be very specific in the type of search that i'm doing so i'm going to bring up my browser in here and if you take a look at this if you look at what the search is it's community.riskiq.com slash search slash trackers slash and i'm going to be looking for the h and this is case sensitive htt track source host with a slash at the end if i put any domain at the end of that it will look to see do i have any http htt track um domains that have been copied okay so this is a way that you can put your own domain in there and what i would recommend is um you go through and say here's the irs payment one so i did a search this is how i did it um and i found this this irs.gov but when i go there there was a link to say get my payment and it was a different url the url was sa.www4.irs.gov okay so i want to use that domain in search so if i went through and i and i made it hc3x source host slash that domain i would see anybody that's copying it so give me a second i'm going to stop and let me view my bookmarks and i'm just gonna i already have these pre-populated to make our life easier so give me a second i'm going to open these up so i have here's the search that i did to find it uh, i went in and this is where i would click on to see it okay and this is that domain so if i start that off with that community.riskiq.com slash search trackers HTTP track source host and that domain I find four domains that have been copied, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go and look at these using tools and not the back end, but using free open source, freely available tools to show you how you can do these examinations and find bad infrastructure that was linking to good infrastructure by copying it. So if I come into this first one and if I right click and open, that's how I can get to this uh, opened up another tab without losing my current view. So if I take a look at this, it's already been tagged as phishing. Um, I can see that uh, the analyst insights are saying it's bad. Sometimes you might even see a um, an icon for um, um, where it's located, like the country map, instead of having to go look at the resolutions and see, Hey, is it in the US or a foreign country? There'll be a, like a flag up here, and that's on the enterprise one. Somebody had asked that question earlier. But if we look at these trackers, you'll notice that here's the track, uh, here's the uh, the domain, and here is the, the website. This is the page that they copied, okay? So they also did a mark of the web as well for, for a different domain in Australia, but this has now been, this is a copy of this. So now if you go through and you go, well, I don't want to just visit this because it's a phishing site. It might be bad. What can I do to see the image? Now, Risk IQ has platform solutions that will show this all in our, our interfaces. But inside of this investigation tool, those images aren't available for you to see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this domain. okay, And then I'm going to go out to URL Scan.io. So um, because of this, um, showing up that the last scene was on the 22nd it might not be active right now um, i want to do a search from the history so if i go up to search and i put in that domain i get a list of many submissions that people have done from 18 hours ago to 24 days ago um, where um, here's one that has an adobe so they're probably doing something with adobe here's um, one where it's a WM3 start, and all those are the same. So if I took a look at one of these uh, ones down here with the start one, and I open that up, you can actually see a screenshot. So this is the IRS COVID branded attack against them, okay? So I can actually see this information in here. Now, what's, what's nice about this is that um, I didn't visit it directly, I'm safe, but I get the full impact of seeing the image to say, 
hey, it's not active right now, but in the past it was, and I can see how that image looks like um, and how it changed over time. So if I came back here and I opened up this Adobe one and I opened this up in another tab, you'll notice here that they were also doing a, a, a scam where they're sending out like a, a fake purchase order where they want you to log in with your Adobe PDF stuff online so they can steal your credentials. So this is another, uh, a different type of attack. But we're gonna focus on these COVID ones and see, since we're, we're pretending like we work for the IRS, we're trying to proactively find this stuff. Now I want to, to see, are there any other active ones that are happening leveraging uh, URL scan IO in the images that they've captured for me? So if we take a look at HTTP, okay, um, you'll start to notice that there's some logos and images that are here. So here's IRS logo JPEG. And if I come here to this little um, search area, if I open this up, it gives me the capability of seeing a resource hash, okay? And if I right click and I open that up in another tab, oh, there's the image. Um, I can get additional information. So here we go. So I'm going to right click, open in another tab. Here it is. And I get this list now of all of the same image, because it's been hashed, everywhere it is in the world, okay, that they've seen from 24 days ago, a month ago. So I can see that this was active about a month ago. And I can see all the different websites. So there was another one using that exact same image. So it's probably related. Um, to the same threat actor because it's the exact same image um, going through here. So I can see several different ones that are in here. So this is a way for me to expand my investigation. Now, um, if I looked at another one that was listed, um, so if I searched on one of these and I brought up like, like this one, for example, I can open that up in another tab. And when I see it, hey, here's the image, the exact same image, same, same attack, okay? Same phishing campaign. Now, if we come back to Risk IQ, um, this is our enterprise platform where we call this the digital footprint area attack surface, um, where we can show you information um, that we've detected and we show you. So because we were doing a COVID report where we were going out and finding threat actors that were trying to scam uh, people with COVID related information. And we have a weekly report that we've been publishing. It was daily, it's now turned to, to weekly. Um, we found this active on several different days. So if you take a look here, um, we can actually see the days that it was active, okay? Uh, we get a picture of it when we first crawled in the most recent crawl. Uh, the who is information, the DNS, the site details, okay? Um, how it was classified, what we found that said, hey, it's COVID related. Um, and even um, the crawls. So I can go through and see, hey, the first crawl, here's the response. Here's the document object model that's in here. So remember the stuff that we're doing in the SF, when you buy our, our platform solution, where we're looking at your, your attack surface management, when we find somebody that's duplicating your site, duplicating your logos, attacking you, um, we're able to give you this information, you can see it. And then once you confirm it, it automatically gets added to our blacklist. 95% of the world's browsers can't go there. And, um, and then the takedown can happen, which takes about one to four days to take it down. But all of these things are listed here. Um, so you have all of this information. This is like the source of truth, truth that if you go, is this a phishing attack against me? Yes, I can immediately see it. Uh, and somebody who's not so um, technically savvy to go through and do this investigation, can do it immediately from this interface. So I wanted to look at um, additional one that was listed in there. So if we saw this one, it's another HTT track going to the same place. And if I went out to URL scan IO um, and I see these here two months ago, I can come into here and open this up in another, um, another tab, okay? And um, from looking from this, this path, uh, they also had a submitted bit.ly, um, a shortener, that's how it was initially uh, submitted to URL scan IO, but they found out that the final URL was this, this other one. And I can do the same process that I did before, looking at um, a, an image from in here. And inside of here, um, I will show you which one I searched on. There's a hash for it. 
Let's find it. So this SVG in here, okay? So if I came in here and I right click and open another tab, um, I now see all these other ones and there's one from four hours ago, but this is the real IRS. So these are real IRS, real IRS, real IRS. And then here's one that doesn't look like a real IRS and this was five days ago, okay? So now from here, if I right click and open another tab, I can now find, hey, this has been classified as malicious and here's how it looks like. So this is how you can take what Risk IQ has, find all of the things that we know, but because of a lot of these other tools out there, people have automated process to submit their fish and different things, you can leverage the information to look for active new things. So this, this URL, for example, that we have here, I can now take that and put that into Risk IQ and go in here to community, search for it, see information in here, and look at like the host pairs, for example, um, see they're pulling scripts from different places um, and I can I can do my investigation. You can see, hey, it's pulling um, stuff directly from the IRS. So this is a way for you to expand your investigations to look at known good infrastructure and find bad um, infrastructure that's duplicating your good stuff and trying to do harm against you. Um, are there any questions so far on what, what we've shown for this? Hey, Benjamin, uh, we do have a question around, could you explain the image part again and sure. where to find on URL scan, et cetera? Sure, no problem. So um, so when you when you search for something inside of, of URL scan IO, it allows you to see um, different types of, of infrastructure that's out here. So for example, I'm just gonna come in here. So from the summary screen that when we initially found one that was bad, um, there's this HTTP um, section. So this is basically all of the resources that like the full document object model, all of the things that are listed there. But what they do is they allow you to see the actual image. So <coughs> inside of here, um, I can actually um, expand out the little search area and show additional details. So by clicking on this little magnifying glass, I can see it. And I can actually look at the, um, the image, but I'm being blocked because they, hey, it's, it's, it's bad. Um, so from inside of here, I, I found this IRS logo JPEG and I clicked on it. And inside of here, there's a resource hash. And if you click on the resource hash, it then searches their database to, database to find any other relationships with that image. So they got the hash, so that's the, the unique value for that image, and you search it, and then you find every other match that was using that same unique value. And that's a way to expand it that most people um, don't think about when they're doing these investigations. Um, we have a thing called the min hash algorithm. So we hash the entire document object model and all the sections. So we're able to compare every um, website to every other website in the world. And we do that automatically for you. Um, so that's, that's kind of one of the ways that we do with our detection. Now this is a manual way to do this, but you need to have that a database of those images to be able to do it. And URL scan IO has one. And so I wanted to show you this feature because uh, threat investigators might not be aware of of a way to expand a dead end that they get into to say well he's now moved on i don't i don't see it well they might be using the same images on a different piece of infrastructure someplace else in the world and somebody submitted that to url scan io to be crawled um, and then they were found got it thanks okay so um so when we when we take a look at this, we started off with four different domains. All of these are bad. And you see the first scene, last scene. So the last one was just cleaned up on the 22nd, but those images are, are um, very similar to other ones that have happened as well. So by pivoting through and finding um, related infrastructure, 
um, not only in our tool, but the other one, you're able to do the infrastructure chaining to figure out additional uh, IOCs to add to your investigation. So um, from the initial good domain, looking at HTTP, we found all these other ones. So I wanted to show you one other demonstration before getting into um, um, getting into um, an, our exposed services. So if we take a look at this URL up here, we have this, this one. So anything that's dealing with a logon, so like if I did a Netflix login, I have Netflix, love them, and here's, here's their URL. So if it's just netflix.com slash login. So if I came here and I erased this domain and I did um, www.netflix.com, I see 21 different domains that are listed here, and I see 24 IP addresses. So we see one as of as of today. So if I copy this one, okay, I'm going to now open this in another tab as well. I'll come in here and do URL scan IO. Um, I'll throw this in. I'll do a public scan, okay, and let's take a look. So the, under the trackers, you can see that, hey, it's it's linking to slash AR. So I don't know what slash AR, so let's do. Um, uh, it's in a different language. So that's a different language one. So this is still running. We're going to give it a second. So this is probably a, a phishing attack from a foreign country. So it didn't show anything in the screenshot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and go to search, and I'm going to copy this domain, and we're going to come in here, and I'm going to search the history. Okay. So they only had this one for 40. So this is the one I did. It's not active at this particular moment in time. So let's go back here, and we'll grab the next one. So if I copy this one, and I come here, and let's search for this. So I can see, hey, it failed 26 days ago. There's a payment one in here. Let's see what this is. This is a Netflix payment one that they were doing. So this is a way that you can look at your own domains. So it's completely usable. Um, if you want to get your skills up, um, the best way to do it is to, if it's a phishing attack, it's going to be uh, on some sort of um, credential or uh, something like that. So a credential harvesting type thing. So if you search for a domain space login, you'll get the domain that you want to look for. You can't search for the URL. So if I come back here, if you if you notice here, if we look at this one, for example, uh, if you look at the trackers, because of the slashes, um, you can't edit the URL to look for that particular thing. It only lets you look for the domain itself. But because we're doing it as a um, URL edited search, it's limiting the results to just be that type of indicator. Otherwise, if this is in um, you know, a Google analytic code, if we had that domain, or if you used it in anything else, you might see many different types of results. So this is a way to filter it down to just see that one particular type of tracker in your search. Any questions on this? And we've done previous ones with Mark of the Web. It works the same way. Um, you can look on YouTube, see those um, different videos. Um, and if you want to see a Mark of the Web next time, um, just let us know in the comments uh, when we email you or in the chat. And the next uh, workshop we'll do, we'll do a Mark of the Web as well. So you can see how, how it works. But it works identically the same way. Any questions? Um, that you can see, Barrett? No, I think we're clear to keep moving. Uh, someone did ask if you could share the link. Um, the the links were were um, added in there. I added uh, both of the HC tracks in the chat, so they're in there already. Um, and we already had the um, URL scan IO at the very top of the chat. So I'm going to now go into exposed services, and I'm going to share those particular uh, searches. There's two of them. Um, and then we'll go through and we'll, we'll talk about these. So give me a quick second. I'm just going to open these up in a new window. 
right? And then one more. Okay. Just to, to save some time. Okay. So exposed services. So what I'm going to show you now, if you're a free user, I'm really sorry, you don't have access to this. But you're going to be contacted next week. Um, we're going to give you a one week promo code, but then you'll be called. You want to do an enterprise trial where you can try the full version uh, with no limitations on, on um, the product. We can set you up with an enterprise trial and the enterprise trial will have this access. So um, we don't make this available to everybody because if I can go through and search for a particular um, port, uh, that might be open with a particular vulnerability that's accessible. It's an easy way for somebody to find out, an automated way to find out, okay, I, I'm going to do this attack and this is a way for me to find it. Uh, I don't, we don't want to make that available. So we have uh, made this only available to uh, paid threat investigators to, to limit the availability of this information. We need to safeguard it a little bit and this is how we're doing it. Um, so Exposed services uh, are enabled for enterprise users and passive total. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to go through and show you how that works. So I picked two different types of, of exposed services that we're finding. And this is a combination of looking at the web components and the ports and header banners that we see. So a combination of those, we're able to really make a good determination of what's running, and, and what versions there. So in this particular case, we're looking, I, I picked some um, automated building control systems. So these are things that you should never find on the internet. It should be behind a firewall. Um, but when people set up these things, sometimes they don't follow best practices uh, or they're not aware of the best practices because it's not something that they do all the time. So um, this BAC is a protocol that, um, Heating, refrigeration, air conditioning engineers use to have their devices online so they can control them and see them. Now, an example of an attack against some of these types of things, um, Target um, was attacked through an HA, HVAC um, vendor that had access to all the Target stores to be able to control the heating, air conditioning, turn the lights on and stuff uh, in the past. So I picked this one because it's kind of similar when you're thinking, well, well, what's the big deal? Well, if I can get into one of these systems, then maybe I could put a skimmer on all the, the POS machines, uh, the point of sale devices, and start stealing data. So um, this is a way that people get in. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go through, and I'm going to, um, I gave you the two queries, and we're going to go through and, and examine uh, just a couple um, to see what's there, what we see, and if these are truly um, accessible from the internet. And I have a screenshot, okay? So I'm going to stop for a second. And the reason why this is important, there's some um, CVEs that have been announced that are bad for these. So it's really important to make sure that if you have them, they're patched and they're not accessible from the internet. So if you run this query, um, no domain showed up with them, but there was 540 different IP addresses associated with them. And you can see the type that uh, Automated Logic Corporation, uh, all these different ones listed. So there's hundreds and you see the IP addresses listed here. So I picked one in particular. Um, I'll find it in the list so you can follow along. So if you come here and we look for this one, the very first one in the list, if you click on this one, okay, um, it will now take you into this view. And if you have the enterprise version, um, you'll see these services, the services area on the on the right. And what what this does is it starts to show you the type of information that we're getting from these systems. So this is like the, the banners that are returned when we're doing the mass scanning and crawling the internet, um, doing the 2 billion web crawls a day, we're grabbing this information and we're utilizing it and we're taking this information to make it actionable so you, we can understand attack surfaces that are out there. And this is a vulnerability to an organization. If somebody can go in and turn off your your heating air conditioning to your server room and it overheats and catches on fire, that's pretty bad. Um, so this is a way for you to 
see your exposures from a physical standpoint, but also um, from um, a regular cyber standpoint as well. And this is in Hong Kong. So if you took that IP address and I, and I went to it, I actually get a login prompt. So it's pretty serious. Shouldn't have this available. It should be behind a firewall. You have to VPN in and then have access to it. It shouldn't just be right there available on the internet. So it's really important to, um, to look at these things and understand what's out there. So um, other ones I wanted to go through, there were some, um, an, here's another um, one I found um, and another login as well with it. So it's, it's pretty serious. So um, you can do, if you're a pen tester, you're gonna love this because you can now start seeing this information and understanding what's out there. Um, and taking that information to utilize it in your penetration testing without having to scan them to figure out what's there to be what's available uh, before your engagement even starts. So this is completely useful to you. Um, the other one I'm going to show you is very similar. Um, it's a, a web control. It's using the same um, protocol um, and also uh, Modbus and, and SNMP. Um, and once again, it should never be out there, never be available. Um, and if you do the search, you can you can find uh, many of them. And I picked a um, a school. And I, I found one. It happened to be at a school. So let's let's take a look. So give me a second. I'm going to bring up this version. They have some uh, vulnerabilities associated with it. So the very first one uh, is a school. And if you click on it, um, you'll see that it's been up for quite a long period of time, this, um, this system. Um, and if we take a look at the um, IP address, it, we, here's, the, here's the domain name, but if you have to look at the IP address to see the services. So if you, if you pick the IP address and you, you search on that, you can now see the services tab. And from the services tab, you'll see that information that, that we, uh, we got back from the control system. But if you visit the web page directly, that, that domain, you actually get the login prompt. So another serious issue uh, with your security. So this is to, to highlight um, your attack surface and RiskIQ can help you manage your attack surface um, and automate this process to show you not only what you have, but things that maybe shadow IT or marketing or somebody else has put in place or third party resources that you might be utilizing to make your, your organization function. So um, I wanted to um, offer that if you like to have a digital footprint attack surface management snapshot to show you connected assets, and this is like the video I showed you to show you what you have, what you're hosting, is it in the cloud, is it, is it, um, is it a third party resource that you're doing? We even do, um, we even have the ability to do JavaScript monitoring like we were showing you earlier to show your exposed services, the vulnerabilities, and um, the threats that might be coming against you. Um, you can request a, a free snapshot, okay? Now, we're also going to be sending you out an email. And if you're, if you're using our community edition or your paid user, um, you can, we'd love to have you uh, let Gartner know um, your thoughts on these workshops, what we're doing, and the, the tools that we're making available to you, uh, paid and free, that help you in your daily life. Um, we always ask you to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, um, and we're putting out tons and tons of content like this video will probably be on the next day or two out on YouTube. Please go to YouTube and subscribe to our channel. We'd love to make more content available. Um, are there any other questions, Barrett, from the audience? Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, here's one. Uh, is PT able to monitor, monitor for obfuscated puny code for particular domains? Um, or are you there? Yeah. So, so we okay. monitor for that in our external threats product. So um, when we're looking at uh, typo squat domains and domain squats, that's where we're able to monitor for puny code domain registrations, specifically against a certain organization. 
so think of it this way. Once we know what you have, then we get all the permutations of, of what might be um, similar to you. And that's in our external threats, looking at your attack surface and then finding the threats that are coming against your attack surface. Um, the investigation piece, you can then take those and use our tool to do the investigation, but you can't set up free monitoring for that inside of Passive Total. It just it doesn't work that way. Great question. Awesome. And I think you jumped into this one. Um, if we have the paid version, where can we see all of our services exposed? So you have to go to an IP address to see the services. So if you have the paid version and you search on one of your IP addresses that's externally facing, um, we'll show you all the services that we see associated with it. So it's, all, it's not under the domain, it's under the IP address of the domain. And you know, if you have any questions or you want to see a demo of any of the products, um, you can contest it, contact us at success at riskiq.net. I really want to thank Orr. He's an expert at the JavaScript uh, mm -hmm. threats. Um, and I really love that he walked through in such detail to show you what it will take to do manually. And um, some JavaScripts change daily, weekly, monthly, and for you to have to go through and investigate and look at it, it's a huge Herculean task to be able to do it. And that's why we have um, a way of automating to find these things and, and tell you what's really bad and what's suspicious that needs further investigation to help you narrow down that, that, that pile of straw to find that needle in the haystack um, so you can protect your organization. So Or, do you have any closing remarks? Um, no, appreciate the time. Thank you for taking two hours out of your day to uh, watch us and learn. Um, and we're always open to questions. You guys can reach out to us. We can help out uh, with any any issues that you may have, or if you're curious about some of the other stuff we do, just reach out. Don't hesitate. Yeah, and we do this because we want to help the community. We want to show you these techniques. We want to show you these things that are not even in our products because we want to give back and show you how you can do things to help your organization and expand your, your security influence and visibility. Uh, our whole um, aspect is to discover unknowns and then to investigate threats. And that's what we're trying to do is show you how to discover things that you don't know about and how to fully investigate them to really understand if something's good or bad. So awesome. thank you everybody for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming out today. Thank you to Benjamin and Orr for a great workshop. Um, as they both mentioned, reach out to success at riskiq.net with any additional questions and everyone have a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank you everyone, bye-bye.